Hi guys, welcome to another installment of the Digital Kitchen. Today I am joined by Jamie, who's come down from Robocoop to chat with us today. Uh, we're going to talk through the stands and then we're going to get in the kitchen uh, and look at some great food options and some uh, money saving options as well with some food waste and some interesting ideas and recipes. So uh, Jamie, thanks for coming down. Let's see what we've got. Let's have a chat. So Jamie, thank you very much for joining me today uh, here at the NCEC. We've got your wonderful stand, Robocoop. So for those who don't know, I'm sure there's not many, but Robocoop, who are you and what do you do? So we invented the food processor, okay. which is a bowl with a blade that rotates, um, which was about 19, early 1960s, roughly. Um, since then, being the market leader, we've come across with the veg prep machines, the combined machines, stick blenders, automatic sieves, juicers, etc. Um, so we now do about 140 machines, okay. all manufactured in the same place we started in 1960s um, in South France. Okay, perfect. I guess Robocoop's the name that everybody's sort of heard of. It's similar to the big names in the industry. Everybody wants a Hoover and things like that. But Robocoop yeah. is what you'd have in the back of the kitchen. We just take it for granted, really. It's there and it's just a little bit of a workhorse. Um, so you say you've got the different types, but I guess we've got different sizes as well. Obviously, yes. we've got a, a small example here we've got some on the other side which we'll look at as well um, but sort of talk for this range so you've got the 201 301 401 and then so on and so forth blixers and things these are sort of words we're hearing and phrases we're saying what's the what's the sort of difference so the combined machines normally ha always have the three numbers the first number is roughly the literage of the food processor bulb it's so r301 three liters the final number is normally a one or a two if it's a one, it doesn't chip and dice. If it's a two, it does chip and dice. Okay. So we have the 401, which is a four liter bowl, and a one, which means it won't chip and dice. Then we do a 402, which means it will chip, and dice. chip and dice. It's a real simple way to look at it. Then with the food processors, they've always usually got the one number. So R4 means it's a roughly a four liter bowl. Okay. So that's an easy way. These go up to 60. So an R60 would be a 60 liter, liter bowl. bowl. It's not exact science, but it's a rough, rough sort of measure. You're a rough sort of guy, I guess, depending on what you're doing. Yeah, and then what you always do is take that number, half that number, and that's roughly how many kilos you can do in a batch. So an R4 would do roughly two kilos. An okay. R60, 30 kilos. So there is method behind the kilos. numbers then, it's not just a, we'll pick some out of the box. Once you know, it starts to make <laughs> more sense. sense. With the veg prep, there is no sense. Okay. And so you have CR20s, 40s, 50s, yeah, etc. Yeah, CR50s, the, uh, yeah. everyone knows. <laughs> There's not really a reasoning behind it, but once you get to the CR50 and above, you can chip, you can dice, you can do mashed potato, and they can do you anything from 250 kilos up to about 1.8 tons per hour. Okay, wow, so big, big range. Yeah. Um, and I guess you've got a blade, you know, I've seen the blade catalog you've got, and there's a pretty much a blade for, for everything. And I guess if somebody's got an issue or a solution they're trying to solve, uh, you know, it comes to you guys, because if you haven't got yeah. the answer, then no one has. <laughs> yeah. So we can do everything from dicing, grating, we can do brunoise, gourfret, waffle cut, mashed potato, french fries, slicing, grating. and Anything weird that strings of mind that somebody's asked you to try? Anything a bit, a bit different? There's been a few. <laughs> I can yeah. um, we get a lot of sort of like sometimes you've had cooked chicken, which has been one. One we had recently was um, for mozzarella cheese. So normally with the mozzarella cheese, we'd always do it chilled, but it doesn't seem to work on a dice. Because we're in uh, 130 countries, we spoke to our colleague in Italy, and we found that with the fresh mozzarella cheese, if we take it to room temperature, we can then slice it um, more evenly. Interesting. Which goes against everything that we should be doing. Yeah. But it's interesting because when we have more cuisines, especially coming up to the UK and Ireland, we can speak to our colleagues from those countries and find out, ah, oh, we've been doing this for years, this is the best way, for example. Interesting. And I guess that's a fascination with the role, isn't it? You get to work with so many different people and everyone's got a problem you're trying to get you to solve. And uh, it's always fun when you find out little quirky ways like that. Yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, so you start off with the with these sort of machines that yep. everybody know of, but we also do other stuff as well. So if we fly to the other side of the stand yep. and see what's there. This is, sort of, I guess, some of the stuff that people may not know you for. Uh, Robocoop, to me, I've, as I've always been in the kitchens, has always been the food processes, you're grating the cheese, you're blitzing, all that sort of stuff. However, there's other stuff in the range, in your arsenal. So do, should we run through what we've got here? Yeah, of course. So let's start with the Blixer. 
because this one always gets mixed up with the food processor a lot. The way to tell the difference between a Blixer and a food processor, first one is it says it Blixer, says Blixer on the front, so yes, which is always yeah. a giveaway. <laughs> um, they also have an internal blade okay. or, or paddle system. Okay. The difference between a food processor and a Blixer is, if I put nuts into a food processor, I get nib nuts or powder. If I put nuts into a Blixer, I get peanut butter. Okay, so it's just a lot quicker, a lot, a lot more finer. Efficient. The motor's quicker, it's a lot more powerful, the blade orientation's different. There's a lot of variations. When you look at the outside, they look similar. When you look at inside, it's completely different machines. Okay. So these are designed predominantly for texture modified food, for pure race, for care homes. That's their purpose. Okay. Where food processor won't do that job. Was that designed for care homes? Yes. Or was it just, a, oh, this works well in that industry? Let's. 100%. This was designed purely for the care home market. However, we can sell a lot of these to the Lebanese restaurants okay. to do hummus. Uh, the food processor uh, for Greek hummus, which is slightly grittier. Uh, Lush Cosmetics use these to emulsify their soaps. We get paint manufacturers that use these to take down their paints. Uh, a lot of peanut butter manufacturers will also use these. Now the number, same as before with the food processor, is roughly the literage. If you have that number, that's roughly the kilos. So Blitz are three, one and a half kilos, three liters. But when we say liters, it's to the top. Okay. You'll never fill it to the top. So Blix are three, half the number, one and a half kilos, one and a half liters, roughly. Okay. Blix are ten, five liters, five kilos. It's an easy way to sort of work it out. So would it make sense for somebody to have a Blixer then just in the kitchen? So if you're doing things like, I don't know, pea soup, for instance, would you then not need to pass the soup? Would that bring it down far enough? You can. You could use something like that um, if you want to really get those purees down. However, we have a machine called the Robo Cook. So the Robo Cook is basically a, a blixer or a blender, is what we prefer to say, and a food processor in one machine. Okay. So you've got the two different blades. But as the name suggests, it's also a cook. So we can heat this up to 140 degrees by one degree increments. We can make the blade go forward or backwards. So for example, if we were to make it go backwards, we could do a shoe paste. We could uh, go forwards and chop up our onion and garlic for risotto, and then go backwards and stir it as we're cooking, Okay. which is pretty clever. Um, we could also use it for tempering chocolate. We could also not use the heat function um, and do purees, like we would in the Blixer, but we could do everything we could in food processor, like short crust pastry, for example, uh, or mayonnaise. So this is kind of an all-rounder. The only limitation is it only comes in this one size. Right, okay. So that's why within care homes, it's probably not always the best option. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a really good, clever piece of kit for um, sort of gastro pubs, restaurants, anyone that's steak restaurants, you can do a hollandaise, bernays. Yeah, I was going to say, that'd be the obvious choice when they do like a hollandaise in yeah. there. Or Saves desserts. Messing around. Desserts is really, yeah. really nice. Yeah, brilliant. Then and we then come over here, so slightly different, we have the juicers. So they're centrifugal juicers, which means we drop an apple in, we get apple juice to come out. Um, you get obviously cold press where it presses them down. You get the citrus juices. This is completely different. It has a spiral system on the inside. Let's just open this up. So as you push the fruit through, this system here pulls it down. So that way you're not having to push down because the more you push down on the top, you're slowing the blade down. And slowing the blade down, it's like putting your washing on a low spin, you get more less liquid, juice less juice. Yeah. And you want the juice because that's your profit. Of course, of course. Um, with regards to food waste, we can take the pulp because it's quite dry and use that further. So if it's carrot pulp, we could use that and do a carrot cake, for example. Or if it's some uh, fruits, we can make it be do like a fruit lever or cool. something like that, which is I think that's amazing. what we're going to come on to later on in the kitchen yes. when we go in the kitchen and play around with so some stuff. So we can try out and yeah, see what little taste of what's coming up there. But yeah. Different sizes, different amounts. 80, 100 litres? Yeah, so J80, I say under 80 cups a day, J100, over 100 cups a day, okay. roughly. And that's so the two sizes you do, any, any other ones? We do the J80, the J80 buffet, and then the J100. So the J80 buffet um, is tilted forward ever so slightly and has more of a bigger drip tray. Okay. So it's designed for self-service, so it just keeps the area cleaner. 
where this one, they're very, this point upwards is the same, but the motor's more powerful. Because the motor's more powerful, it's designed for juice bars, okay. like doing large volumes. Yeah, so if it's so. like a cafe or restaurant um, that has juice as a side, then that's where the AT comes in perfectly. Really, okay, really perfect. Nicely. So we've got the juices, and I guess then the last bit on the stand here we've got are the, are the stick blenders. Yes. So we do four ranges. We do the micro mix, which I think we're going to show you uh, later today. Yeah. We do the mini, we do the um, compact, and we do the, the big one, basically. So mini MP, CMP, MP, okay? The number represents the length from here to here in millimeters. So 160 is 160 mil from there to there. 240 is 240 mil from there to there. Then as we get up in size, the motors become more powerful, but they also become heavier. Yeah. So you might find in certain circumstances that this is too heavy. So you want to go down a size, but you can get the same length in the stick. Um, so you can vary those up and, up and around. Okay. Um, we also have these now with whisks. So if you want to whisk cream or some people like to use them for mashed potato, we have that as well. Okay, perfect. So we've got a fair, decent arsenal of solutions for, yeah. uh, for prepping the kitchen. And then um, we've got the new blender, which we haven't got on the stand at the moment, which we do yes, in a so three and a five litre. Yeah, that's um, that which, one. Uh, Innovation products. Yes. The Nisbet's like yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we do the five litre BL5 and the three litre BL3, which is designed for liquidizing soups and um, various things like that. Really good for purees. Perfect. So I guess uh, with you guys as well, because obviously this is what you do, this is your. your, your itinerary right here so to speak of what we've got you've got a great digital setup as well haven't you yes. where you can link up to people anywhere um, and solve problems really and just look at what they're trying to do and trying to achieve and then test it before you sort of invest in it because um, obviously they're not you know don't get me wrong they're not cheap machines so we need to make sure it's going to do the job it's intended for before we purchase um, and that's where it's really great so Jamie's you know more than happy to he's got all the discs and everything at your disposal you can try everything and to be fair the amount of time we've been in the industry you probably know the answer really before we even start testing that's why it's always interesting to see if you've had any really quirky ones. Yeah. Because I guess all the stuff that most people have done or tried, you've probably had a go at yourself or tried to make it happen. So it'd be great if you've got any questions or queries to reach out to Jamie or myself and, uh, and we can sort of help you out and uh, hopefully get to the bottom and get you a machine that's going to do the job that's intended for. Um, but yeah, so I think the next step, we've obviously looked at the stand here and it's just, as always guys, the stand is here at the NCC. So feel free to pop in and have a look at what we've got here. And again, we can try the machines out if you need to come in and test your, uh, your product through these machines and make sure we're going to get that result but one of the big things you're focusing on currently is food waste um, which is a massive massive issue um, around the world globally um, so what we'll do I think we'll go in the kitchen and then we'll start discussing through those and there's some really cool tips that I think we're going to be looking at and going through and uh, yeah so stay tuned for some interesting uh, stories and Hot tips. So yeah, should we go in the kitchen? Yep. Perfect. Welcome to the uh, the webinar. With uh, I'm joined by Jamie Clues from Robocoop. So thank you very much for coming down. And we are going to focus on. Well, you are. I'm just going to be here as your uh, sous chef, so to speak, <laughs> uh, on food waste. And you do some really interesting things, very sciencey, techy sort of stuff as well, which is great. Um, obviously, food costs massive waste problems in the UK and across the globe. So anything we can do to try and help our customers reduce costs, especially in this day and age, is really on point, I think. So that's why we've sort of done this session today. Obviously, you go on the road with this sort of session, don't you? Yes. Um, so it's sort of bringing it here, which we're really grateful for. Okay, yeah, we'll talk through it. So yeah, over to you, sir. Perfect. So if we bring up the slideshow first, what I want to do is I just want to give you some stats and figures um, just to understand really how important food waste is. Um, so a third of all food produced is never, ever eaten, okay? Now, if you added up that growing space for all of that food, it would equate to the same size as Egypt, India, and the USA combined. So if you filled those three countries with farms, basically what we're doing at the moment is harvesting that food and throwing it in the bin, okay? So it's a huge amount of food. If you added all that up together, you'd feed 1.8 billion people a day or enough to feed the whole population of India and half of Europe for free every single day. Um, or another way to look at it, if you took every single person in the world who's currently in food poverty, you could feed them all the food they need twice over. So it just shows you how major food waste actually is. 
30% of all food waste is from the hospitality industry alone. And that uh, 1.3 million meals a year is just from the UK hospitality alone. 45% of that waste is from food prep, which is what we're going to partly go into a little bit to, um, into today as well. So the environmental impact. So if food waste was a country, it would be the third worst environmental impact after China and the USA. Um, a lot of people always think plastic waste uh, is probably one of the worst environmental things at the moment that a lot of people have uh, sort of focused on. But if you took food waste, environmentally, it's over 240 times worse uh, for the environment than plastic waste. So, um, I want you to put your hands up. We well, you can do if you want. If you put your hands up, put your hands up in the air because I can see you on the screen. <laughs> Everyone, hands up. Yep, keep them up. So, if you think, um, so one potato, how much water does one potato take? So, if you think 10 pints or less, put your hand down. If you think 20 pints or less, put your hand down. 30 pints or less, put your hand down. Oh, so we sailed at 30 pints. It's actually just over 72 pints of water to grow one potato. Okay, so we'll come back onto that in a second. Now, loaf of bread, put your hands back up again. Hands up. So if you think it takes less than 50 pints, put your hand down for, to grow one loaf of bread. So as in the grains to make the bread. 100 pints of water, put your hands down. 150. 200. 250. Oh, we sailed on 250. It's actually 1,350 pints of water to make one loaf of bread. So the interesting way to look at that um, is, we can come off, uh, yeah, we can come off that now. Um, the interesting way to look at that is in kitchens, commercial kitchens, we're always telling people, stop leaving the taps on. If you throw away one lo half a loaf of bread, basically it's the equivalent of you leaving the tap on for 750 pints and letting that just run down the, into the drain. So, looking at a potato or any of these vegetables, it's, this is not just the potato. This is 72 pints of water. Think about the fuel, the energy costs it's taken to get this out of the ground and transport it to wherever you're going to be using that. This potato has got way more history and background than just a basic, simple potato. So when you're peeling this and using this, you want to keep in mind 72 pints of water. Okay? And there's a lot of places in drought, especially at the moment, um, you know, with uh, the heat waves, etc., Water is really important, and if we're literally peeling this and throwing away 20%, what's the point of, you know, yeah, harvesting waste, that much? Literally yeah. throwing it down the drain, isn't it? Potatoes as well, I don't know if you notice at the moment, the cost of potatoes has gone up 55% in the last two to three weeks. If we can find a way of using 20% less potato, we can bring the cost down. Yeah. It's as simple as that. So, <clears throat> another start to remember as well, for every one pound invested in reducing your food waste, um, according to the RAP um, statistics, basically equates to about £12 return on investment for every £1 invested, Okay, which is huge, so, I think. Yeah. Some stats are closer to 9 but it's about 9 to £12 roughly. So, we'll start with the potato. The humble spud. The humble spud. So one thing a lot of people are doing at the moment is skin on. Skin yep. on fries, it's huge at the moment. Couple of different reasons. If I peel that potato or I stick it into a rumbler, I'm losing 20, sometimes 30%. Now, the way I like to look at this is if I owned a mobile phone shop and I sold mobile phones, if I bought 10 mobile phones, I don't pick three of them and throw them out into the rubbish. You sell all 10. So with a potato, if I'm buying a potato, I don't peel 30% and throw it in the bin. Yeah. You still can use that. So skin on fries is a fantastic option. You'll see five guys doing it. Uh, Burger King are just doing it at the moment. I think McDonald's yeah. probably won't. Um, where did I go the other day? I went to a steakhouse the other day and they've now swapped over to skin on fries. Couple of reasons. One is there's a lot more flavor in skin on fries. I was gonna say, you get that crispiness you always see. Them. They, they, you get they sort of overcook them, but they, they do it on purpose. Yeah. To give you that nice crispy flavor. So you get that, there's less waste, which is really important. Yeah. 
Um, and weirdly, most people will pay more money for skin on fries than they would on fries. So you're charging more money for something that's saving you money, yeah. which is it's, really, it's really a win -win. good. Um, now, in some cases, you do have to peel the potatoes, okay? So if I was doing a roast potato, for example, I would tend to still peel them because I don't like the skin on the outside. I don't think it goes as crunchy. Some people would disagree, but I still like that traditional roast potato sort of finish. Yeah. So in that case, if I've peeled that potato, I've done it quite quickly there, I would keep these skins, slice them down a little bit, and what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put them in some water for, for like, you know, five minutes or so, just to wash off some of that starch mix. Yeah. Um, we've actually got a customer in Ireland who collects all the potato skins from the local restaurants um, and sells them, fries them as a similar way we're about to do, um, sells them for six pounds a bowl. So by taking this waste product, we can turn this into something valuable. From a restaurant's perspective, for example, we could take those and we could do them as a side order. Yep. Um, if it's a school, we could take them and roast them off and have them as a, a next to a sandwich. In the care home, you can have them as an extra snack. Yep. Um, at home, I like to have them on a Monday with a bit of chili on top. <laughs> you know, there's loads of ways you can use it. These in the water were store in there for about four or five days as long as you change the water every day yeah. and they work really well. So we'll soak those a little bit and then we'll come back to those. So looking at some of the other vegetables, broccolis, okay. So I can see you there now you've purposely picked a broccoli with a... The biggest stalk Biggest stalk you can particularly yeah. find. <laughs> what, what you'll find, especially in most restaurants or most supermarkets at the moment, stalks only used to be that high. Stalks have doubled in length in the last six to eight months because you're paying for the weight of the broccoli. Now, I've actually added this up. Uh, I did a little test a little while ago, and I weighed the whole weight of a broccoli, and then I weighed the, what was left. This was 50%. So you've yeah. seen at the moment, a lot of people in supermarkets are snapping these off. Um, done. But this is edible. Yeah. It's completely fine. So I'm gonna take off that dry bit at the end. That is what should go waste. However, what you can do, sometimes I blanch those, or, and then I dehydrate them. So you blanch them just to soften them up, dehydrate them, and then blend them down. Um, and you can have a, like a broccoli seasoning powder. Yeah. What we're gonna do here, we can either grate these, or we can slice them. Um, and we're just gonna put these into a little pot, you can season these up with whatever you want, but I'm just going to do a little bit of oil, and I think we'll probably do like a little bit of miso. Um, and then we're just going to roast those off. But say if you were doing like a broccoli uh, soup, you could use them for those. Uh, I quite like to use them as well to do something... Um, to, if I'm doing like a coleslaw or something like that, I think they're quite nice in that as well. So just using that sort of stalk. Why do you think it's sort of ingrained it into us to waste these parts of products? And why do you think it's only coming to light now? Is it because, obviously back in the day, especially like, you know, let's go back a, a fair distance into like the wars and stuff, people were on rations. Obviously you'd want to use everything anyway. Waste was, you know, you were struggling to get food. So then yeah. where at that point between there and now, has it gone, ah, it's all right, we'll just throw all that stuff away. It's not really important. Was it because it was, everything was too readily available? It was too easy to get hold of. So we didn't bother in worrying about it. We just want the prime cuts. So we want the best flavors in restaurants. We don't want to use anything else but the breasts, you know, but the fillet, but the, uh, you know, the heads of the broccoli, that sort of stuff. Is that where it sort of originated from? I think a lot of the problem is the cost. Um, so, for example, broccolis were cheap. Yeah. Um, if you look at the uh, cows, for example, a cow, we take a whole cow and we found ways to use all of it because it's expensive. And it's got to a point that we're looking at food as, oh, we don't pay much for that, so we just throw it away. Yeah. Um, in America, for example, they throw away 55% of everything they buy from the shops. In the UK, we're not much better. We're close to 40. Right, okay. Um, but I think the problem is, for a lot of people, is they don't know they can use this. They don't know that's edible. Um, yeah, I guess it's ingrained in you. So you always yeah. throw that away. It's always appealing you to yourself. That, that's, that's, that's what you're paying. Yeah, that's the goal. People <laughs> assume that's what you're paying for. You're not. You're paying for all of that as well. Yeah. Um, that 
it has flavor this has way more flavor than this yeah absolutely this is more nutrition in many yeah. cases than you some use of all the, the soups and stuff the broccoli soup you yeah. get a lot more flavor coming through that than you would the actual heads itself or you remember the days when we used to have uh pig bins in yes. the restaurants yeah absolutely um uh, obviously <laughs> they got banned now <laughs> yeah. because we were feeding random stuff to pigs yeah but the great thing was from a commercial environment we started to look at what was going in those bins yeah before you throw them out and then we'd start going oh is that profit how much how can i make more money from that yeah and i think that that is kind of one of the big problems is we've kind of stood quite far back from it now and not realized how valuable these yeah. other items are yeah and it comes back to that idea i said with the mobile phone shop we don't buy for example in the shop you don't buy 100 items and pick 30 of them up and throw them in the bin you you sell them and it's trying to understand that is profit. So what we got here, slightly different, um, is we've got some rosemary salt, okay? So what I've got there is I've got some leftover fresh rosemary that I had, um, and I just blend it up with some salt. That there is two months old. Yeah, if I took that rosemary and used it elsewhere, um, it wouldn't have lasted two months. Yeah, so we've extended the shelf life for this considerably. And I'm just gonna sprinkle that on top of those potato skins, give that a little shake around, and then we're going to roast those off as well in a second. And they're a great little snack. They're a great extra thing to use. And it's trying to get people to understand this is profit. This is money. Yeah. Okay. That's what's really important. And what's interesting now as well is you see you go to a restaurant, certainly a higher end restaurant now, and they're charging a lot of money for what was essentially the cuts you wouldn't use or you'd throw away. Yeah. You know, we always used to buying fillet beef as the prime cut or fillet salmon and so on and so forth. But now you're seeing stuff like, you know, the cheaper cuts, like the tongues or the, the, the shins and stuff like that. And now being made into dishes and people are going, oh, I'll buy that. Not really, you know, thinking years ago, this would be a, a discarded cut, really, maybe into dog food or what have you. But And we just want the prime fillets. But again, it's, it's, it's funny how it's going around. So now, in theory, we're paying a lot more money for stuff we used to throw away. Well, remember uh, belly of pork? Yeah. Belly of pork, we used to use that in the kitchens all the time because I used to get that for free. Didn't pay for no. it because it was a waste product. Yeah. Now, to go back to fillet restaurant. steaks, <laughs> uh, I checked the other day, belly of pork is now more expensive than fillet steak because people have moved away from that fillet steak because it's so expensive. Now fillet steak is becoming a waste product because nobody wants it. Want, it's interesting, um, but everyone now wants that belly of pork. Yeah. And it, that's that's where from a restaurant perspective it's i always look at uh, commercial kitchens very similar to the fashion industry that it's our place to set trends to to use things but chefs aren't doing that they're not looking at it as, oh this is fashionable they're looking at ingredients and going what can i use to make more money yeah and in doing that it becomes a trend that goes further down. Yeah. Most people cook belly of pork. You can go in Tesco's now and buy belly of pork, which was unheard of before. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So another product that most people forget about, cauliflower, okay? We take the florets, the core, we can grate that down, mix it up with the florets in however way we're using that. If you're doing a cauliflower cheese, these leaves, these are really nice. Um, I would eat one now, but I don't want one on the microphone. Um, <laughs> But we can slice these up and mix these into a coleslaw. Or what I'm going to do here is we're just going to roast these off. So that there, if you look at the amount of leaves and greens we've got, um, and these have got way more nutrition than that cauliflower because you can tell with the, the chlorophyll on the, uh, on the green there. So we're just going to throw that in there as well. So if you see there, we've got so many different items. Uh, what should we mix in this? I'm, I'm sort of making this up as we go along. Um, put a bit of oil on there, and then we'll come back to that. So we've got the broccoli stalks, which would normally not be used. We've got the potato skins, which would normally just go in the bin. We've got the, the, the cauliflower leaves. So there alone, we've got a meal as a side dish for probably two people mm. that's free yep. in my eyes um, and that's food that we can use so we'll whack this in the oven and then we'll come back onto the other items there but yeah go back to the kitchen days obviously in the previous life so to speak now but on a saturday you're prepping for your sunday roast you'd have literally buckets and buckets full of this stuff um 
literally going in the bin. Yeah. And uh, as you say, it's, it's ludicrous, really, when you think about it. It's oh, literally it's, throwing money away. And it's, um, I did uh, some work, well, I had a conversation with a guy called Wojtek Bay, um, who opened the first ever zero waste restaurant in Cambodia. Uh, in the UK, we've now got Silo, um, but this was prior to that. And you see most restaurants are doing it now. And the one thing he said to me, which really stuck with me, is don't look at that as the ingredient is inside and that's the packaging that is your ingredient the whole thing yeah which brings us on to bananas um so when we look at this banana we think the flesh the fruit is on the inside and that's the only thing we can use however we're wrong because that whole thing is an ingredient okay so when you get a banana like this it's a slightly a little bit black on the outside we'll peel this off if it's a little bit black, um, a little bit bruised, and you don't like the flavour, you can mash these down. I use them for dog food. Uh, work really well with snaps. Well, they're really good. That's sort of the level we'd use bananas for if I was making like a banana loaf or something. Banana really good. loaf, yeah. Just I a little bit brown everyone, and gives it a nice mushy sort of texture. Everyone was doing banana loaves <laughs> during the pandemic and yeah. stuff, weren't they? But then we take the skin. Now, the skin's edible. There's nothing wrong with this. You can use this in many different ways. So we're going to take the skin there, and what we're going to do is we're just going to scrape off this extra bit of flesh on the inside. Okay, now this part here, we can use that um, and dehydrate that. Okay, so we can put it in the dehydrator like the one we've got over here, and then blend that down, and you've got a really nice banana powder. Um, and this part here... We can use this in different ways. We can either slice this up and put this into a stir fry, or what we're going to do is we're going to make some banana bacon. Now, I wouldn't personally suggest this in a bacon sandwich. <laughs> However, it works That's a bold really, claim. That is a bold yeah, claim. Yeah, I, I wouldn't <laughs> do it in a bacon sandwich. But as a, uh, like a salad topper, it's actually quite nice. So what we've got... So let's just take that. What I sometimes do with these as well is I'll put all my banana skins in, a, um, in the freezer um, and then defrost them as and when I need them. Because when they're a bit blacker and sort of bruised on the outside, they're actually much easier to use, right, okay. much nicer, I find. Um, so we'll just scrape that off. Then in here, I've basically got a mix of um, barbecue sauce. I've used some Korean barbecue sauce, a bit of honey and a bit of smoked paprika. Okay. But you could use maple syrup yep. or anything like that. You kind of want something that gives that sort of bacony flavour. Yeah, something um, smoky. Yeah. You can, I've seen it before, you can do like a pulled pork or you can slice it and just mix it up in a stir fry, which works just as nicely. Yeah. So um, I guess one of the ones you might have heard of more commonly, I guess, is like banana blossom. So they use them a lot in yes. uh, substitutes for, for meat, sitting like cod and things like that. Yeah. But banana skin is edible, you know, and the more that people start to realize that, the more people will find really good, nice, fun uses for them. Um, because so often this is something that we just throw away and we're throwing it away because we don't realize we can eat it. Yeah. People are scared sometimes or nervous to try something that's not the ordinary, not yeah. the norm. Check the grill. How are we doing in there? So, Five minutes. what we've done there, just going to lay that out. You could do it in a frying pan if you want to. We're just going to throw this in the oven yep. and then we'll try this in a bit. So, I guess as well, what we're doing here is everything's on a, you, know, you could do this at home. This is not a commercial Massive. environment. Obviously, on a no. commercial environment, we're going to be scaling it up. And I guess that's where the rubber cook machines come into it and the big dehydrators. But there's a small dehydrator on the end there. You know, it's, it's not that expensive. And you can really get most out of your food waste and stuff by having these simple products uh, to help. But Again, we're doing it without any Dehydrating. mechanical assistance, should we no. say. <laughs> yeah, if you're doing larger volumes, like I would take the core and put that through the veg prep and grate down. That works really well. Or I would slice it down and speed up the process. Most food waste reduction, you generally need to process again. Not always. Um, like the potato skins, that's a manual way of doing that. I'm not potato skins, banana uh, bacon, sorry. But the dehydrators, so... Coming back onto the vegetables, carrots. Yeah. One thing I'm trying to get people to, to do at the moment is stop peeling their vegetables. Because once you peel this carrot, you've lost 15, 20%. And the nutrition is on the outside. The fiber, the goodness is on the outside. So wash your carrots the way we always used to. However, 
sometimes if you do need to peel them for anything specific, that skin is still edible. So what we've done here is we've dehydrated the carrots and we've blended them down. So we've got a really nice carrot powder. You can buy this in the house shops for fifteen pounds a kilo. Okay, <laughs> that's just a byproduct of what we're cooking free. on Sunday. Yeah, it's completely free. Yeah. I've not, and this carrot powder we could use on top of a carrot cake. Yeah, we could add to our smoothies. Yeah. If we say if we've got a juice bar or a smoothie bar, I could charge you another fifty p to yeah, put for a, a, scoop a, a of nutrition shot in. or something like that. Yeah. There's so many marketing ways you could use this byproducts, and it's free. Yeah, this is a great thing yeah. about this. We even sprinkle on a salad. You know, yeah, options are endless. Really. Yeah. yeah. It's once you've got these ingredients, you find ways to use yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, butternut squash, fantastic one. Everyone, my wife hates peeling them. Most people hate peeling yeah, them. Yeah, because they're open. I watched someone peel one the other day, and I, I'm not joking, like they were like this, <laughs> and they were peeling down the side like that, and they, by the time they'd finished, <laughs> they had <laughs> a rectangle. that much left. <laughs> okay? They lost so much. Why do we peel butternut squash? you can eat the skin completely fine yeah. if you take a butternut squash and you just dice it roast it um it works perfectly fine yeah um, we used to steam them first so you used to steam a hole and make them easy to peel but yeah, yeah. that's because we were doing them on a large scale obviously in the, in the catering environment but so the just, should we check uh, i think the, there's bacon i think the bit uh, uh happy with them i'm trying to take them a bit further yeah they look good yeah perfect oh can we just cough there um so coming back to the butternut squash the seeds are edible Pumpkins, the seeds are edible, okay? So we can use all those. Whenever, during Halloween, it always upsets me when you see people carve out these pumpkins yeah. and then throw the flesh throw away, throw the feet. And it's, they've taken quite a, six months sometimes to grow. I understand you want to do the carvings, take the flesh out, use it. But the seeds in burnt nose squash and in pumpkins, we can use these. So what we've got there, we've just roasted them off. Yeah, roasted them. Uh, wash them, roasted them off. Yeah, it's very um, floral. Yeah, just mm. season them up however you want. That is an amazing salad topper. Um, I saw the other day, I looked in the supermarket yesterday to buy, I think it was about 100 grams. I think it was about four pounds. Mm. And it's, it's, all the, it's all the rage now, isn't it? It's all this, you buy your nuts and seeds and put it on your granola and all that sort of stuff. In the oh, brew. mix those two and together. And you're paying a lot of money for yeah. stuff we're throwing away. And this, this is the thing, you can use all this stuff. So coming back to what we've just roasted off. So we've got, um, which camera? I want to show it on the camera. So we've got the broccoli stalked. You could sprinkle a bit of parmesan on top of these. Yep. Works really well. We've got the potato skins, which are really nice. And you see that they've got so much flavor. Now, if we just mix that up, so we did like a little bowl, for example, of, of vegetables and mix that up with there, maybe put some seeds or something on the top, we can put together a nice hot salad. Yep. So just quick or a side dish. Up. Or a side dish. For, a, for, a, for um, you know, you took that's four or five pounds foods. quite happily in a restaurant for that as a side. And you'd order it because it sounds great. You know, yeah. how you could word it on a menu, you know, roasted, dehydrated so-and-so with a sprinkling of this and the other. Oh, I love that. And yeah. Realising it's something that we've essentially taken out the bin. <laughs> well, look at all these super bowls. Super bowl, exactly. vegetable bowls and stuff that you can buy at the moment. That, this, will taste better than kale. And how much people are paying for the kale. Yeah. That's what that And it's literally the is. stuff you're throwing away. Yeah. So. And from a restaurant's perspective, maybe they're not producing that many cauliflowers, but they could speak to the local pub that does 200 Sunday roast. Well, can I have your broccoli leaves, please? Mm. They'll be more than happy. Now you've got that as a, an extra item. You could dehydrate those and then uh, powder them, and you have a nice broccoli, kale leaves, yeah. or like a, dust, a, a snack, yeah. which mm. works quite well. So, fruits. So, we had a we did a, a, a study a little while ago with a large pub group, um, and we found that they were basically in their lemons for their soft drinks doing seven mil slice. Now the perfect slice to go into a soft drink is four millimeters. Anything less than four millimeters, you lose the lifespan of that lemon. Anything more, and you're just putting it in there for no reason because it's not infusing into the drink. So we found four mils optimum slice. So by them giving seven mil, they were wasting three mil. They didn't look at it as waste, but it was waste because they weren't using it. Oh, banana yeah. skin. Can you check the bananas? Yeah, they'll be done. They won't be overdone actually slightly. Um, so you, they were losing three millimeters, okay? So what we want to do there 
Let's put this on the back here. Set. Which move out of the way. Yeah. Let them cool down. Um, they were losing three millimeters. Now, once we worked it out for the whole group, um, it actually equated to just over three point six million pounds a year in food waste just on those lemons. So sometimes what we're throwing in the bin is not always just the food waste. Sometimes if we're slicing something too thick or too thin, too thin sometimes it reduces the shelf life, so we're throwing it away more often. Too thick means we're just giving away something for, for no reason. Yeah. So from a business perspective, as we touched on earlier, by looking at your food waste, just by investing one pound and getting that 12, 14, nine pounds back, sometimes just by having the right piece of equipment, to be able to produce or adapt this food can make a massive difference. Yeah. So when it comes to lemons, for example, slicing at four mils, perfect, but then sometimes we're left with uh, excess lemons. So this comes back to the dehydrator. We can dehydrate those down. These will last ages. For cocktail bars, these are all the trend at the moment. They're massive. You can add that to a gin and tonic or something else, or you can infuse it or maybe put some smoke into it and have a smoked orange or smoked lemon yeah. dehydrated fruit and add so much more value. So that was, those in there are two years old and they still smell of lemons. <laughs> or we take the skin. Yeah. So in the kitchen we're using the juice, but the skin is still valuable. So we could turn it into jams or marmalade, for example. But what I've done here is I've just taken the skin off, placed it into some sugar, and we've got candied uh, lemon. But that sugar now tastes and smells of lemon. Yeah. Or limes, or oranges, or whatever we might want to do. And that will last six months to a year in there quite happily. And we can use that now as a flavoured sugar. And then just keep topping up the sugar. Um, coming back onto the dehydrated, before we go on to the, uh, the mayonnaise there, I had some uh, customer two years ago now actually, not show up for a demonstration. I had two kilos of ginger. So I decided to blend that down and make a ginger beer and a ginger syrup, um, which was amazing during Christmas. Then what I did is I took that ginger pulp, dehydrated it down, and we ended up with little ginger flakes, which is beautiful. Then I took some of that ginger pulp, added lemon to it, and I've now got ginger and lemon, fresh tea, herbal teas, um, which smell, Amazing. They've still got that. Drop that into the water, stir it in. And yeah. Happy days. If I was in a restaurant, I'd charge you four pounds for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's just something I had left over. Yeah. Again. Now, to go into somewhere that's offering fresh herbal ginger and honey teas like this, you pay a premium price for. Yeah. But that, I already got my product from it, which was the ginger syrup and the ginger beer. And then I've taken that waste product and turned it into something Money. else yeah and that's yeah, that's where we all need to start thinking um i had some used coffee grounds i took those used coffee grounds i um basically put some oyster mushroom um i forgot the name now into them so i grew oyster mushrooms from my used coffee grounds because they're um clean sort of way to to yeah. grow your mushrooms i ended up with too many so what i did is i dehydrated them and i ground them down this, as a seasoning, is amazing. Um, we were talking earlier about putting like smoked paprika in there. Yeah, and some making like your own rubs and, and stuff for the meats. Because yeah. that's really big at the minute as well, isn't it? Doing your own meats and smoking and things like that. But There's a huge amount of health benefits to this the, the, with the mushrooms. But what we've done is we've taken, again, it's trying to think that once you've taken a waste product and used it, how much further can you go? Um, a great example is... Um, there's a customer we were working with a little while ago and he found chicken skin um, was going in the bin. Restaurants were just peeling it off, producers were just peeling it off and throwing this chicken skin in the bin. So he thought, wouldn't it be nice to make chicken crackling? Which is an amazing idea. However, it was still a little bit oily, um, but it was nice. It was, it was almost there. So then we were working and talking to him about, actually, if we took this chicken crackling and made it into a crumb, that you could put it on top of a salad, for example, Nando's, chicken salad crumb, which is amazing. Um, and it had re done really, really well. But then he looked at that. So he'd already used the waste product. And then he thought, how can I use that even further? Yep. And he was left 
paying lots of money to get rid of his oil that he was cooking the chicken in. Once he tasted it, it had a real nice infusion of chicken. So what he's now doing is selling his used oil that he was paying to get rid of in bottles and selling it as a premium chicken flavored oil. Okay, <laughs> that's, yeah. so he's taken a waste, made money, made more money from his waste. That's how you want to start thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. So another one that we see a lot is chickpea juice, also known as aquafabia. So aquafabia, for those that don't know, is um, an egg white replacement. Yeah, a lot used in vegan cooking and things like that. Yeah, you definitely. can buy it in the supermarkets, I think. I've never seen it, but you can. I've been told you can. And it's quite expensive, very expensive. So if you've got anyone making like a vegan mayonnaise or wants to make their own mayonnaise, all you do, take your aquafabia, or you can do this for lemon meringues as well, which okay. is quite nice. Yeah, I've done the aquafabia lemon for lemon meringues. Yeah. Meringue, yeah. I don't know why lemon jumped in. It's uh, part and parcel of the name, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's always nice with the lemons. So we're good. make your mayonnaise as you normally would. Splash of mustard, splash of vinegar. When I had the chicken oil, I made it with chicken oil, okay. which is the one I said about. And I had a chicken flavored mayonnaise. Didn't split? Wasn't, no, no, perfect. Obviously it wasn't vegan at that point, but <laughs> yeah, so. it was really nice. Now what I do with microfibia now is if I've got too much left, I put it into an ice cube tray and I freeze it. So that's another way to think of extending the shelf life of things. Quite often, you can just freeze things down. Yeah. Let's see where that stretch. There we go. So let's show you. So all we've got is that aquafabia and the vinegar, but you'll see it's just going to foam up. So it's interesting they're using a stick blender over a food processor, because normally you'd use a processor to make um, mayo. You can, but I find with the higher RPM of the stick blender, it's just much easier. Oh. If you were doing a larger batch, then yeah, 100%. Um, but when I'm making it at home, I normally just use my stick blender. So is that the smallest stick blender you've got? Yes, this yeah. is the Micromix. This is okay. the smallest one we do. But you can literally just pour it in. And what we'll get is we'll get our mayonnaise as it starts to emulsify and mix with oil. If you know the quantities, you can literally just pour it all in okay. and do it in a little jug like this. And you'll see before your eyes, Back vegan quick. mayonnaise now very, very quickly the great thing is with this is you've got homemade mayonnaise which is more of a premium product you've got vegan mayonnaise which again is even more of a premium product and massively on trend and if you can <laughs> see that so you see the mayonnaise there now all i've done there is i've just put like a little bit of honey mustard yep. if you want to go a little bit thicker you can now, I've been trying to promote this a lot into care homes. But what we're telling them in the care homes is don't call it vegan mayonnaise, call it mayonnaise. Because it's still mayonnaise. But as soon as, um, as, soon as you say vegan, people are put off. Meat free was a major issue because people were being told your food doesn't have something which people didn't like. So you'll see at the moment a lot of food is plant based. It's vegan, it's, it's all that generally, but plant-based means it's based on plants. It doesn't always mean it's meat-free. Yeah, yeah. But the terminology that you use. So to call this a plant-based mayonnaise will sell for a premium versus calling it a vegan or meat-free mayonnaise. So sometimes it's the wording you use as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I could use those chickpeas and make a falafel, or make my hummus or whatever I might do take that water yeah. and turn it into something else as well. Yeah. And again, I don't think it's people are throwing it away because they cannot be asked to use it. I think people are throwing it away because they don't realize yeah, they well, it can is. use it. And that's what's and again, quite it comes down to the educational purpose of uh, you know, going out there and doing these workshops and making people realize what you're throwing away you can actually use yeah. and make great products with. It's not just a case of using it to, uh, we can sort of get by and live on the poverty line because we've got to eat aquafabia <laughs> you can actually make a really good yeah, product with it and 100%. there's be a dressing you know there's loads of options you can do with that and the the, the vegan mayonnaise for example the plant-based mayonnaise you buy in the supermarkets is really expensive yeah. um i can just make it with a little bit of oil i use rapeseed oil but you can use any oil you want um i get that because it's local so it's got a lower carbon footprint than some of the other oils around there um the biggest thing that that i always say to people to look at is 
as chefs, we should always have a little container next to our chopping board. And as we're prepping our items, any vegetables that we're doing, put into that container. At the end of your shift, just to have a look in that container and go, oh, can I use that? We've all got phones these days, we can all Google things. Can I use potato skins? Yes, here's a hundred recipes. Oh, I, I like that one. Can I use broccoli stalks? Yes. Um, give you an example. So the other week I was doing, uh, I bought some broad beans from the local um, farm shop. Took all the broad beans out and I was left with the, the shells. I thought, I, and I was literally, I was this far away from throwing them in the bin. And I thought, can I use these? How could I use these? Because they're quite tough, they're quite furry, they're not, the texture's not very nice. So I started Googling it. If you bread them, you can deep fry them and they make amazing flavor. Uh, or you can stir fry them. So even myself, I've been doing this for years. But to even look at something and go, question yourself. That's the biggest thing, curiosity. You need that curiosity. You need to start looking and going, how can I use that? What can I use that for? And before you know it, the food that's going into your bin is being reduced. There's less going to landfill. Because the problem is, if you're putting your food into landfill, it doesn't break down. It produces methane, which is green gas. Uh, you know, it's not good for the environment. No, no. So what can you do to reduce your waste? And what can you do to add more nutrition into your daily life? And um, also save money as well. You know, it's going to be a big massively. money. Massively. If you think we're throwing away 40%, if I said to you, would you like me to reduce your shopping bill by 40% a year? You would say yes. Yeah, absolutely. If it was a quick fix and you could tick a box, you'd 100% do it. So. If I said to a restaurant or a hotel group or anyone, if I could let me reduce your food cost by 20 to 40%, mm. they'd be like, yes. Yeah. And everyone's looking at the cheaper alternatives. But instead of looking at the cheap and cheaper alternatives, what can you do with the food you already have? Because it's well at the moment, there's a new legislation coming at the end of this year where people will have to pay to throw away their food waste to feed the biodigesters. Because um, the biggest problem at the moment with the biodigesters, so for those that don't know, biodigesters will take your food waste and produce that methane and use it to make energy. Yeah. At the moment, there's more biodigesters than there is food because there's no s system set up to collect the food. So what the government's currently doing is paying farms to grow food to throw into the biodigester <laughs> to give energy. So, sort of a, so the system's yeah. a little broken at the moment, but... <laughs> The idea there is great, but the problem, what's going to start happening is restaurants would be charged more or they'd be charged money to throw away their food. Yeah. Especially in London, they pay per kilo. Yeah. So whatever we can do to help reduce that, we're reducing down that food waste cost, but also they've already paid for that. Yeah. So yeah. something else, we've covered on dehydration, dehydration. We covered on trying to use the whole vegetable. We've shown you some key little fun things you can use, um, you know, like the aquafar beer, etc. Um, and we've also done one in the past where we've taken, you know, the syrup you have in your fruits, tinned fruits? Yep. Put that into an ice cream machine, you get sorbet. Again, another free item. <laughs> so fermentation is the next one I want to That's sort of getting catch really on. big now, isn't yeah, it? That's, it's yeah, it's really building up. Yeah couple of reasons. There's a big thing going around at the moment, uh, your gut biome, your microbiome. And it's all about getting uh, the good bacteria back into your body. Um, this is something everyone should really look into because there's been studies on this for years and it's only now starting to come through because we all eat too much highly processed food. Now from a restaurant's perspective, there's so much they can do on this. If you ferment food, you add a different flavor, it changes. You can then play with something. It's something everyone can do quite easily. And it's not something to be scared of, it's really easy. So here, I had um, cabbage that was left over from a demo. So what you do is you take the cabbage, you slice this down in your robot veg prep to whatever thickness you prefer. Whatever the weight of the cabbage is, you add 2% of salt but it needs to be a, a, a good quality sort, not one that's got loads of chemicals in it. You squash it and that produces its own brine, which is its own flavor. The salt enters the cabbage and pushes out the liquid. So it gives that cabbage a whole different flavor. What I've done here is I've infused this with uh, some garlic, some chili, and some thyme. 
Um, that now is two weeks old, but the brine just changes it. And then what I've also done, I've put this into my scrambled eggs in the mornings, right. and it's really adds something different. Or you could take that fermented cabbage, put it into the dehydrator, and then turn that into a powder, and you've now got a whole different seasoning. So you could do fermented celery salt, for example. You saw that on the menu, you'd be like, oh, I'll have one of them, that sounds yeah, amazing. Exactly. <laughs> but now, this celery, I've added a bit of salt to it, and a bit more salt, and a, by the process of doing it, that celery is now probably 10 times the sale price as it was when I started. That's, yeah, and yeah, we're that's reducing you think, the waste. So there's nothing else in there apart from salt on the waste cabbage? Yeah. That's it. Oh, chili, thyme, and garlic. Okay. But you can but flavor the actual process it itself. Yeah, there's still like loads of vinegar and stuff in there, nothing like that. You need to put a weight on top. Um, it's one of those things you can make it. We all know if something tastes or smells bad. Yeah. If it looks bad, smells bad, don't eat it. It's yeah. as simple as that. There's loads of books out there. There's loads of things around fermentation. And it's not just cabbage. We can do carrots. We can do courgette. We can do any vegetable, pretty much. So this is different to pickling, because that's what people would assume it's pickled but it's not, isn't it? It's fermented. So. It's fermented, yeah. yeah. And because it's fermented, you've got the live cultures. You'll see, I don't know if you can see in this one, it's been in the fridge, so the, 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 I sort of slowed it down. You'll see bubbles coming up. And that's the, the good bacteria that's getting into that food. Um, but that cabbage was less than a pound. I could sell that jar now for six, seven pounds. Yeah, probably. Because of what it because is. Of just the process you've done. Because yeah. I've changed the process. Yeah. And this is something every restaurant can do. But they need a, something to prep it, to slice it, etc. And it's so easy to do. Then on a slightly different note. So here, we've got what I call water kefir. Okay? So the water kefir is very similar to milk kefir, but it's a different type of grain. It's like kombucha. Okay. So you could do this with kombucha as well. I mean, a tin of kombucha now, I think six pounds. It's a lot of money. So going back to the beginning, what is, what is that? What is it as a raw product? So it's what we call a kefir grain, a water kefir grain. So a kombucha, you have what's called a scoby. Uh, dairy kefir, you have dairy kefir grains. It's basically a live bacteria that's okay. good. So it's been har harvested, a bacteria kept, and it's then turned into this product which we had. Yes. Yeah. And what we do here with the water kefir, I don't know if you can see the bubbles on there actually, they're, they're actually, it's quite lively at the moment. Um, what you're gonna get is you're gonna get the water, the sugar, and the grains, and the grains eat the sugar, like as if it was um, you were making beer. Yeah. When it does that, it produces a really good bacteria in the liquid. And you can see the bubbles. Let me shake it up a bit and you can see it a bit more. Oh. It's getting excited. Yeah, now. it does get too much. <laughs> come so, down, come down. That natural carbonation is the bacteria inside extracting, given that, 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 the bubbles, if you like, and eating those sugars. So it's still water gone in there. There's no carbonated water. water. Sugar. Nope. Water Amazing. and sugar, and that's it. Yeah. And the grains. It's yeah. the grains that are doing all the work. Does the process. Then you take the grains out and you make another batch. Take the grains out and you make another batch. And the grains grow. So I started with 40 grams. I've now got uh, 280 grams, roughly, okay. in three months. So they keep growing. I'm, I'm giving them away to everyone as much as I can. <laughs> then what we do, it's in here. So we've got the water, we've got sugar. Then what I've done is I've added whatever juice that I've got left of something. So if I had some apples or some carrots, I can add the juice of that into this and change the flavor or the ginger. And then this, I could sell for six, seven pounds a bottle, yeah. which is crazy. I guess the health benefits are from it. You, you, you can sell it, especially like the, Massively. you see them now in supermarkets a lot. You see the ginger shots and the turmeric shots or, you know, these healthy shots that people are doing and the juice bars and stuff yeah. where you pay a lot of money and essentially you can create it here. And it, again, it's just making money for you. And it's almost like a sparkling wine, but for a restaurant, for example, to be able to make their own water kefirs, to make their own, there's a, um, a, a new tap uh, sort of bar place that's just opened in London, which is um, non-alcoholic non-alcoholic, the younger generation now don't generally don't always drink alcohol, to offer a fermented drink that's flavoured with your own waste products um, and you can change the flavours up and down and to have all that health benefits is a win-win-win yeah. um, and it's all stuff you can make yourself. So by making it yourself you're reducing your carbon footprint because you're bringing it in. Um, it's fermented water and sugar, so it's only the sugar you're bringing in, you're not transporting everything else. 
You can use and play around with the flavours. You're using seasonal items, not sending, you know, bringing items from all over the world. So the carbon footprint of this is far less than most other drinks on the market. But from a restaurant's perspective, juice was always a massive thing um, a few years ago. There seems to be a thing against juice at the moment in a lot of restaurants in the UK. This is the new fad. Yeah. This is the new thing. Um, so reducing your food waste and using this sort of thing as well is fantastic. Plus the quality control. You know, you've got control over it from what you could say. You can play around with the flavors. Whereas, because yeah. it's quite a not a specialist object, but it's quite it's not available in every every shop in the world, so to speak. You can uh, control over what flavors you want rather than be dictated by what's available in the in the brochure, so to speak. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and that's where all this stuff comes in really useful. So. Basically, the key point is to start looking at what you, before you put something in the bin, put it into a container, have a look each day, and this is for everyone at home as well as in business, have a look, speak to the experts, you know, give us a call, or have a look on the internet, and you'll find ways to use things. Yeah. If you've got a restaurant that you're working with and they're trying to find ways to reduce their food waste, call us in, we'll come in, I'll have a chat with them, and we'll look at ways Oh, do you know you can use that? We had this recently with the, uh, we had a vegan restaurant in Manchester who was making their own hummus and falafel and spending, uh, I think it was £6,000 a year on vegan mayonnaise. <laughs> I said to her, do you realise that liquid you're pouring down the drain, you can make your own, really? Yes. So she now makes, obviously she had to buy the oil, but the cost is like, it's a third of what it used to be. And she's now can charge more money for that plant-based mayonnaise because she's making it in store and it's yeah. not the same flavor. And again, as I, say, you can, as I say, you can play with the flavors and it can be your signature sauce or your signature to go with something. Same with these drinks, it's you can so make easy. a fish dish and have a, a shot of this to go with it. And all of a sudden yeah. that six pound dish has gone up the 10 quid because you've added this tiny little thing which you're Remember using Remember the microphone. days when we used to make our own mayonnaise mm -hmm. and it stopped because of the salmonella yeah. risk and yeah. things. This has no egg. Yeah. So we can, it's, it's fine, it's safe. Yeah. It still has a shelf life because of the liquid. Um, but you can make it as and when you need to, and you saw how quickly it is to make. Yeah. You can make it in like three to four minutes. Mm -hmm. um, there you go. Thank you very Same much. For you. So I guess obviously here today we've done everything on a, on a smaller scale, but if we do want to do it in a restaurant sort of environment where why I'd be buying in, I know, 100 kilos of cabbage or whatever to do a big function or what have you, this is where the machines and yourself come in to play as well and helping on that side of things. So not only can you go in and say, look, you can do this or this waste, you're wasting that, i.e. like the vegan uh, mayonnaise uh, story there. But you can then say, look, if you get stick blender, you get a blender, you get this, you can do all this with it as well. Yeah. So it's going to save you labor, time, money. So it's all about, it's almost a, do you, it's, I would assume this is a free yeah. process because in theory, it'd be silly not to have someone like yourselves coming in because you're literally going to explain to them how to make more money. Yeah. It's simple as that. You know, stuff you throw in the bin, you just throw it away. So we used to use a system uh, where I used to work before, whereby we'd had a, a basically a big white bucket with the food waste to go into. Yep. Uh, on the system itself, it was loaded up with the menus that we had, so it knew what was going on that day. And then we'd waste the product in, sorry, put the product in the bin to be weighed, and then it would transform that then into a monetary value, knowing that we'd weigh, wasted, I don't know, five kilos of broccoli stalks, for instance, yep. and that equated to X. And then that got added onto a spreadsheet onto the system, and then by the end of the day, you'd know you'd wasted xyz now obviously this is, there's two ways of looking at the system it was brought in to try and make the chefs realize you're not throwing away food you're actually throwing money in the bin yes uh, but on the flip side it made you think what else could i use that for because i wanted to keep my waste down because it came a bit of a uh, almost a competition but how much you waste oh, i yeah. did do less than you i did less than you so uh, systems like that to bring into play but by having you coming in and just looking at the menu as an overall system saying look if you did that that and that, and that it's going to save you this much on food waste if you invested in one of these or one of these that's going to save you X, Y, Z in labor. Yeah. And if you buy, bought yourself a dehydrator like we've got on the end there, you know, very, that's a very small example, but they come in all shapes and sizes. You can then add this to your menu, do all your yeah. desserts. You know, you buy in special dessert um, garnishes or little twills or little bits of stuff you put on top or dehydrated citrus fruits, for instance. Yeah. You pay a lot of money for that sort of thing. For a small pack like that, you have a look at your uh, seeds and stuff in the supermarket. As you said, a 50 gram pouch of that costs you a couple of quid. Yeah. <laughs> We're just throwing them in the bin. So. Uh -huh. This is, yeah, it's such a fantastic Well, this is where it comes back to, to what we said before. So with like the one pound investment and getting 12 pounds back, mm. it's not that, it's not that um, crazy of an idea. 
because if you have the correct equipment, like the dehydrators, like the veg prep, the food processors, etc., to be able to produce yeah. and make this food quick and easy, because the other thing you don't want to do is go down this item of reducing. So if I'm saving all the skins on my potatoes, I then don't want to spend another hour's labour in turning it into something else because then I've not saved money. No. So you need the process and everything there or to be able to turn it into something that's more premium to make that investment back. Um, and to be honest with you, most of the time, it's not us teaching chefs how to cook. It's just giving them some new ingredients to work with. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, is once you say to someone, you can use a banana skin, no, wow, boom, they're off. They're coming up with these crazy, interesting, yeah. unbelievable recipes. It's the same like, uh, some, you know, with the foraging side of things. You can use stinging nettles. You can use all these different things. So as soon as you find you can use these items, from a business perspective, oh, how can I do that? What can I use it for? And it comes back to that belly of pork, you know, years ago. That chefs found that they could get this belly of pork for free. Um, so how can I use it? How can I make money from it? What we now need chefs to do, and everyone in the hospital, and even at home, is to look at that potato skin, which is already in your building, is already with you. How can I use that? And that's coming back to the simplest way. And we've shown fermentation, we've shown, shown um, dehydrating, or roasting, or marinating. You know, there's so many different ways, and you just need to start looking at them and going, yes. And if, if every week, We'll just pick one item. Before you know it, your food waste may just be that piece there and that piece there going in the bin. Yeah. Whereas if we hadn't done the process we've done today and did the food waste of what we would normally have, that white bucket would be, it'd be the other way around. So yeah. that bucket would be full. And I can still use those. Yeah. So then once you get to that level, you're then looking at those and going, actually, how can I use that? And before you know it, you have nothing left. The only time it becomes a problem is when your food waste becomes more popular than the other stuff. Yeah, and then so then before you know it, you're good stuff this becomes your food waste <laughs> because you've not got use for it. Yeah. But then you come back on it again and you go, right, okay, what, how can I change that on my menu to turn it into something else? Yeah. And I think that's the other big thing. Is so what we're, we're in Robocoop, we're all chefs. We'll work with the customer because the main thing is it's not focusing on what you've got left it's looking at how that can incorporate into your menu on yep. a full-time basis specials boards always used to be stuff was going what off. was seasonal <laughs> yeah stuff that was going off <laughs> to reduce your food waste yeah, of and course. special boards were always more of a premium cost at the sale price than the rest of your menu um i used to have a local gamekeeper that used to bring rabbits in and then the rabbits in the uk uh obviously get reduced down because of the numbers and they get put in the bin and I spoke to a local gamekeeper and I got 20 rabbits for free. Now they're more of a premium product, yeah. like the belly of pork. Yeah. And we all need to start looking at, okay, if I'm paying 10 pounds you know, for that box of broccoli, three pounds of that I'm putting in the bin. How can I use that? Yeah. And the broccoli I might only sell for 30 pounds, but the stems, or oh, actually I can change that and now I can sell it for 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. So then how much is that box of broccoli worth to you? And it's, trying to look to at that, that and i think now the veg prices have really shot up mm. um like i said potatoes 55 percent, which is unbelievable um it's going to get worse it's not going to get better it feels like the, the wonky veg boxes ways. isn't it so the, the supermarkets were charging a lot less for the wonky veg but literally because the carrot wasn't straight or the cucumber was a different shape <laughs> why should that really matter it's strange what's embedded in our heads and what's right and what's wrong i do on that it's a weird shape but it doesn't matter. The flavours, everything is all the same. It's the same thing. I struggle to buy wonky veg now in our local supermarket because they're all sold out. Is it? So it is all about education. Yeah. And that's what exactly what this is for. So, yeah, it's been really interesting. So thank you very much for your time. Good. No, it's um, been good to go through it. And like I said, these workshops we do for groups all over the country. Um, you know, and we're here for advice, information. If you've got a customer that's working with vegetables, which would be all of them, um, we're quite happy to go in and talk to them and guide them and show them some ideas on what, what we can yeah, do for them. Perfect. No, thank you very much. All right, guys, so that sort of concludes our session with Robocoop today. It's been fascinating, some really interesting stuff going on and some really thought-provoking 
processes to think about as well, um, even down to the drink and stuff, the food and what you can do. And, and just emphasizing really throwing that stuff in the bin is essentially throwing money away. But as we said before, um, Jamie's more than happy to come out and look at what you're doing and where we can help uh, and really give advice on what you're doing. And essentially in these times, try and save people as much money as possible, um, which is what it's about. You know, we're all in this together as they speak. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it was really good live session. So thank you very much for that. Good. Amazing to have your time, Daniel, as well, and enjoying us and t talking through the standards we did earlier. So all that leaves me to say is thank you very much. Give the old handshake. Thank you for coming down. And guys, we shall see you on the next one. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, for more information on the digital kitchen at the NCC and facility hire, visit the website or give us a call. Details on this are below. And don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned for regular updates on the digital kitchen. Thanks for watching, guys. See you on the next one.